Joan Dyden, George O'Keefe, an essay in 1976. Where I was born, and where and how I've lived is unimportant, George O'Keefe told us in the book of paintings and words published in her 90th year on Earth. She seemed to be advised and as to forget the beautiful face in the Steiglitz photographs. She appeared to be dismissing the rather condescending romance that had attached her by then, the romance of extreme good looks, and advanced age, and deliberate isolation. It is what I've done with where I've been that should be of interest. I recall an August afternoon in Chicago in 1973 when I took my daughter, then seven, to see what George O'Keefe had done and where she had been. One of the vast O'Keefe sky above clouds canvases floated over the back stairs in the Chicago Art Institute of that day, dominating what seemed to be several stories of empty light. My daughter looked at it at once, ran into the landing, and kept on looking. Who drew it? She finally whispered, after a while. I told her. I need to talk to her, she said finally. My daughter was making, that day in Chicago, an entirely unconscious but quite basic assumption about people and the work they do. She was assuming that the glory she saw in the work reflected the glory in the maker, and that the painting was the painter as the poem is the poet. Every choice one made alone, every word chosen or rejected, every brush stroke laid or not laid down, betrayed one's character. Style is character. It seemed to me that afternoon I had rarely seen so instinctive an application of this familiar principle, and I recall being pleased not only that my daughter responded to style, as character, but those George O'Keefe's particular style at which she responded. This was a hard woman who imposed her 192 square feet of clouds on Chicago. Hardness has not been in our century a quality much admired in women, nor in the past twenty years has it even been an official favor for men. When hardness surfaces in the very old, we tend to transform it into crustiness or eccentricity some tonic pepperiness to be indulged at a distance. On evidence of her work and what she has said about it, Georgia O'Keeffe is neither crusty nor eccentric. She is simply hard, a straight shooter, a woman clean of received wisdom and open to all that she sees. This is a woman who could early on dismiss most of her contemporaries as dreamy, and would later on sing her out one that she liked as a very poor painter. And then add, apparently by a way of softening the judgment, I guess he wasn't a painter at all. He had no courage, and I believe that to create one's world in any of the art takes courage. This is a woman who, in 1939, could advise her admirers that they were missing her point, that their appreciation of all of her famous flowers was merely sentimental. When I paint a red hill, she observed coolly in the catalog for an exhibition that year, you say it is too bad they do not always paint flowers. A flower touches almost everyone's heart. A red hill doesn't touch everyone's heart. This is a woman who could describe the genesis of one of her most well-known paintings, the cow, the cow Skull, red, white, and blue, owned by the Metropolitan, as an act of quite deliberate and derisive orneriness. I thought of the city men who I had been seeing in the East, she wrote. They talk so often about writing the great American novel, the great American play, the great American poetry. So, as I was painting my cow head on blue, I thought to myself, I'll make it an American painting. They'll not think it's so great with the red stripes down the sides, red, white, and blue, but they will notice it. The city men. The men. They. The words crop up again and again, and this astonishingly aggressive woman tells what was on her mind when she was making her astonishingly aggressive paintings. It was the old city men who stood accused of sentimentalizing her flowers. I made you take time to look at what I saw, and when you took time to really notice my flower, you hung all your associations with flowers on my flower, and you write about my flower as if I think and see what you think and see. And I don't. And I don't. Imagine those words spoken, and the sound you hear is, don't tread on me. The men believed it impossible to paint New York, so George O'Keefe painted New York. The men didn't see much, think much of her bright color. So she made it brighter. The men yearned toward Europe, so she went to Texas, then me New Mexico. The men talked about Paul Cezanne, long involved remarks about the plastic quality of his form and color, and took one another's long involved remarks, 
and the view of this umbrella kind of rattlesnake in their midst, altogether too seriously. I can paint one of those dismal colored paintings, like the men. The woman who regarded herself always as an outsider remembers thinking one day in 1922. And she did. A painting of a shed, all low-toned and dreary with the tree beside the door. She called this actor rancor the shanty, and hung out on her next show. The men seemed to approve of it, she reported 54 years later, her contempt undimmed. They seemed to think I was beginning to paint. That was my only low-toned, dismal-colored painting. Some women fight, and others do not. Hello. Uh, my dad walked in on me, so I decided, uh, okay, I'm going to continue this later. And as you can see, I'm trying to be able to resume from where I last was, but I forgot to wear my hat, which was a very important omission. Some women fight, and others do not. Like so many silver successful guerrillas in the war between the sexes, Georgia O'Keeffe seems to have been equipped early with an immutable sense of who she was, and a fairly clear understanding that she would be required to prove it. On the surface, her upbringing was conventional. She was a child on the Wisconsin prairie who played with china dolls and painted watercolors with cloudy skies because sunlight was too hard to paint, and, with her brothers and sisters, listened every night to her mother read stories of the Wild West, of Texas, of Kit Carson and Billy the Kid. She told adults she wanted to be an artist, and was embarrassed when they asked her what kind of artist she wanted to be. She had no idea what kind. She had no idea what artists did. She had never seen a picture that interested her, other than a pen and ink made of Athens in one of her mother's books, some other goose illustrations printed on cloth, a tablet cover that showed a little girl with pink roses, and the painting of Arabs on horseback that hung in her grandmother's parlor. At thirteen, in a Dominican convent, she was mortified when the sister corrected her drawing. In Chatham Escapo and Chatham Episcopal Institute in Virginia, she painted with lilacs and sneaked time to walk alone, where she could see the line of Blue Ridge Mountains on the horizon. At the Art Institute of, in Chicago, she was shocked by the presence of live models and wanted to abandon autonomy lessons. Anatomy lessons. I like autonomy better. At the Art Institute's League in New York, one of her fellow students advised her that since he would be a great painter and she would end up pain teaching painting at a girls' school, any work of hers was less important than modeling for him. Another painted over her work to show her how Impressionists did trees. She had not before her learned how Impressionists did trees, and she did not much care. At 24, she left behind all of those opinions, and went for the first time to live in Texas, where there were no trees to paint, and no one to tell her how to not paint them. In Texas, there was only horizon she craved. In Texas, she had her sister Claudia for her for a while. And, in the late afternoons, they would walk away from the town and toward the horizon and watch as the evening star came out. That evening star fascinated me, she wrote. It was, in some way, very exciting to me. My sister had a gun. And as we walked, she would throw the bottles into the air and shoot as many as she could before they hit the ground. I had nothing but to walk on to nowhere, in the white sunset space with the star. Ten watercolors were made from that star. In one way... In a way, one's interest is compelled as much by the sister, Claudia, with the gun, as by the painter, Georgia, with the star. But only the painter left just that shining record. Ten watercolors were made from that star.